Hello again, folks. Uh, this has been a, a, a good, fast-moving morning so far. I promised you when I was here a little earlier uh, that the second part of what in my mind is the same conversation, right? The issue of uh, us getting to solutions to our intractable problems. Uh, this is the second part of that conversation. The first one was political. How do we listen to each other? How do we uh, become a little less tribal? Um, how do we uh, figure out ways in which we can move forward on, on some of our most pressing issues? This part of the conversation is about one of those most pressing issues. As I have told these gentlemen, and I told you earlier, for most of my career as an economic journalist, uh, I thought unemployment or employment was, was the intractable problem, getting enough jobs uh, for enough people. And now we have a situation where uh, in a lot of the world, including the United States, our unemployment rates are actually quite low. We're at 3.7 percent. We technically have more jobs available than we have people available to do them. Now, it's not entirely correct, but more importantly, we've not seen wages go up in a way that is commensurate with the economic growth we've seen in the world. Uh, we, we, people have been promised things that have not materialized and around the world we are seeing this retreat into tribalism and identity politics and the weaponization of culture, a bit of which we were discussing in that first session with the two governors, uh, tied to uh, economics, tied to people's fear about prosperity in their future, uh, tied to a basic insecurity about how you are going to live how you remain in the place that you are in life. We've spent 70 or 80 years th talking about getting ahead, uh, figuring out ways in which you move from uh, a particular station in life socioeconomically to another one, and now we have a worldwide fear, including in developed countries, of slipping out of that, uh, of taking a, a slide down out of the working class or out of the middle class. Uh, but this is all within a context, as I said earlier, of the poorest in the world doing better off and the richest in the world doing fabulously uh, well. The, the middle class around the world is angry, uh, they're feeling left out, and they're sometimes voting in ways uh, that, that reflect that. So I've got uh, two people who've thought a lot about it. They've thought about the reasons why this is happening, they've thought about the things that we do to exacerbate the situation, and what they both have in common. They've, they've written different things, and they think about this differently, <clears throat> but what they both have in common, I think, and you'll correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, is that some of the things we've done that have exacerbated inequality in society um, don't feel like they're things that exacerbate thing, uh, inequality in society. We think we're doing the right things. We, we encourage our kids to do the right things. We vote for people and pass laws that we think are supposed to be solving problems for society when in fact they may be deliberately or inadvertently making us more unequal. So, the goal of this conversation is to identify what some of those things are and identify potential solutions. If we accept the premise, and I'll start with asking Anand that, that uh, growing inequality of uh, social inequality, economic inequality, inequality of wage, inequality of wealth uh, are possibly the most uh, pressing problems of our time because they are feeding. In addition to just being problems themselves, they're also feeding our, our, our weaponized politics. It was not supposed to be like this. If you look at <clears throat> the stories that we were told in this age, about this age, about the new times that were coming, um, we were told that new technologies were being invented that we're going to disrupt everything, that we're going to eliminate gravity itself, that we're going to allow everybody to be their own micro-entrepreneur, allow people to, to live on the beach and, and write a little code and, and, <coughs> and make up for all those lost jobs in, in you know, the middle of the country. We were told that all these wealthy philanthropists, Gates, Buffett, now Bezos, Zuckerberg, and others were going to give so much money away that you know all the schools were going to be fixed, all the diseases, all the diseases, as Mark Zuckerberg promised. I don't think he's done one yet, but all the diseases were going to be. Uh, in, in, I mean, he's he's of course a disease himself, so that's a whole different issue. Um, lean out, lean out. Um, um, we were told. We were told that trade was going to lift all boats. We were told that tech was going to lift all boats. We were told that globalization was going to make the world flat. Well, it turns out 
only Tom Friedman by marrying well ended up well off. Um, uh, so while this rhetoric of rich splaining was happening, rich people telling us how they were going to make the world better through philanthropy, through disruption, through this brave new globalized economy, what was really happening was the most unequal economy in 100 years, the angriest our country has been in our lifetimes, perhaps the most imperiled democracy has been ever in this country, um, a phony billionaire, phony populist, phony president riding the idea of the kind of philanthrocapitalist <clears throat> win-win I can fight for the forgotten while enriching myself all the way to the top of this country. And we've ended up in a situation in which rich people are no longer content to simply be rich, to simply control our politics. Now they are muscling their way into the arena of social change, which is the great corrective to those other problems. And increasingly, and my, my biggest fear, is that rich people have put themselves, appointed themselves to the vanguard of fixing the inequality problem that you ask about. Rich people, the foxes, now are fully in charge of the hen house. And when rich people take over social change, they change change. They de-emphasize ideas like equalizing public school funding across this country and not letting rich suburbs in Philadelphia hoard their own little property tax money for themselves. And they emphasize a little charter school that a rich person could put their name on. They de-emphasize ideas like maternity leave for women, social policy that would actually empower women, and they emphasize <coughs> lean in, which is essentially a policy of telling women to make sexism their problem. And so all across this country, you have a burning need for real change, transformational change. 80, 90% of Americans on the left and right would agree we need transformational reform. And what we have instead on offer is fake change peddled by the people who broke America. And what I'm out here saying is we need to take change back and take it back through democracy. Okay. Uh, that was hot. <laughs> uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to take the part out of Chris Hughes' bio that he's a co-founder of Facebook. <laughs> Whoa, zip. Um, okay. It was a different Chris Hughes and a different face. So, so the question I've got, because we, go, we are going to get to what that real change needs to look like and what those solutions need to be, but before we do that, I think I need to deconstruct with you, Chris, who is we? Who is the we that takes it back? Who is the we that fixes the things that we are probably going to, generally speaking, agree upon need to be fixed? Well, uh, Anon and I don't agree on absolutely everything, but we actually agree on a lot more than, uh, than many might expect. I do think that we live in a country today where a lot of very wealthy people, a lot of philanthropists, think a lot about how to make change in the world, and they tend to default to the micro. What charter school can I help? What food bank can I help? And it's hard to, at least it's hard for me, to criticize that because that often comes from a good place. I think uh, they want to make change in the world. The issue is, so often, uh, helping just a little bit here and there doesn't add up to the transformational change that we need in the country so urgently. And I think the problem is that people don't like to talk about policy. People don't like right, to talk so about mi politics. Mi micro change, to be even more, you can get away from the politics. Micro change, it can, you can identify can a place and school. opportunity, you can fix that. That feels good, that mm -hmm. feels reassuring, and you can identify, you can draw a straight line. My X number of dollars had this Y outcome. That is, you know, that I, you understand psychologically why that's so, so fulfilling. And meanwhile, you go and you're taught. You, when you go to a, a dinner party, you're not supposed to talk about politics. Why? Because it's in poor taste. What that has actually created, the precedent, is where Anand and I absolutely agree. We live in a time where a lot of very wealthy people, people who are, who are wealthier than they have been in a century, income inequality and wealth inequality is worse than it has been since before the Great Depression, are making a lot of decisions about our politics while actually not fessing up to the fact that they are very much involved in the power and the politics that's out there. So I, if, 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 you know, if I could uh, take all the attention mm -hmm. that all 
of those philanthropists, all of those entrepreneurs are putting into the micro projects and transfer it to policy so we could actually talk about the growing, not just income inequality, but the racial wealth gap, the lack of upward mobility when it comes to, to education, the, the challenges that we have with student debt, then I think our country would be a lot stronger. And it might be uncomfortable because it is about politics and often one party is more right than another, but people are going to have to have that right. kind of conversation if we're going to, I think, create the kind of country so, that so we want to So you can go beyond that. I mean, you, you addressed a few that people and businesses could actually come around and, and find some possible policy agreement on, but then we get to guns, and we get to gay rights, and we get to the environment, and we get to infrastructure builds, and we get to all of these things where... Um, it doesn't match the interests of the elite to be involved directly and openly in that policy prescriptive, but Anand, they do get involved. Wait, they do get involved. Go ahead, Even Chris. there, though, those are the, all the issues that it's like pleasant to talk about at the dinner party. Gay rights. Oh, great. Yes. Equality. Even the environment, to some extent. When you talk about economic issues, and who has and who doesn't, and you start to think about, well, maybe it, 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 the pie isn't always growing, or when it grows, almost all of the growth goes to a small group. R and, and, and when tides. you start to talk about things that, that affect people's economic outcomes, well, that's where it becomes tricky. So, and that's where people want to lean back, want, 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 to, want to extricate themselves, rather than I think it's all the more urgent, particularly in this period, for them to, to engage So, So the conversation that's hard, uh, but that has to be had amongst elites, academics, eco uh, economists, journalists, uh, and people with, with money, is that a rising tide, the rising tide that we have heard about for uh, upward of 40 years in this country, the, the, the trickle-down economics theory, the rising tide is now lifting yachts only. <laughs> and most of us live in dinghies. And I'm not saying us because I don't. So that may be part of the conversational problem, right? What do the us who are invited to these things, who sit on these, these uh, panels, what does success look like? If, you, if we take your, uh, your criticism to be correct, what does not doing that look like? I think Chris is absolutely right about <clears throat> the fact that it's incredibly... W Let me step back and say, I think we are at the tail end of an age of markets that has been since the late 1970s through Reagan onward, that's been the age of markets. If you, have, if you were born after 1979, you have only lived in the age of markets, okay? And to put that in historical context, if you lived before that, you were kind of living in FDR's America. And even if you lived in the early 1970s and Richard Nixon was your president, Richard Nixon created the EPA, why? He was a Republican, he believed in small government. He lived in an era of public action set by FDR, and so that was the terms. Similarly, we live in an era of markets and of business fundamentalism. And e even liberals in our time, like Bill Clinton, like Nixon under the FDR era, live in that era and have said the era of big government is over. Even Barack Obama, in his first office that he created uh, in the White House, was the Office of Social Innovation, whose website said, top-down programs from Washington don't work anymore, which A, is not true. Yeah. B, he wouldn't be able to vote without a very effective top-down program from Washington that is continue to be under threat. Um, and three, it's sort of preposterous, but liberals have had to say that to survive in the age of markets and not piss off their donors, et cetera. So when I think about solutions, I think what we need to do is end the age of markets. And that's not as easy as saying, I have a program the CEO can implement on Monday morning. Well, I don't really need the CEO to do anything. I need the CEO to get out of the way. Okay? Because the reality is the problems we have, I'm not saying business has no role, I'm not saying philanthropy has no role. But the particular problems we have at this moment are too big for anything other than structural systemic fixes. The problems of social mobility. You know, the American dream is this amazing thing and the only problem with it is it, it doesn't exist in America. <laughs> I wrote a whole book about how it was coming to India. The American dream is big in India. <laughs> the New York Times is just a story how it's great in China. It's just, it's not here. Um, like French fries are not, you know, necessarily French. And, and, and so, if you take an issue like social mobility, you take an issue like race and racism. You take an issue like how do you actually empower women, not through a lean-in book by a billionaire, but actually for real. Um, those are the kinds of things that can't be fixed except 
through public action, except through fixing our schools at the root, except through thinking about how do you do something like universal daycare or childcare, except through thinking about taxation and why people with billions of dollars should be, the richest man in the world, should be allowed to force 238 municipalities around this country into a bidding war to surrender tax revenues that they could have spent on their subways or Medicaid or whatever and essentially pay it to him. There is no person rich enough on earth to fix those kinds of issues. The old, that's why we have government. And part of what I have been persuaded by through my reporting is that a lot of well-meaning philanthropy of the kind you discussed, people trying to solve the micro, is trickle-down economics with a cherry on top. It's kinder, it's nicer, it's, it's motivated not by a desire to attack a welfare queen, but actually a desire to help somebody, but in its deep assumptions about who makes change and who should lead change, yeah. it's the same old Reagan thing with a kinder, kinder gentler, woker face. So to pick up on that, that Reagan theme, um, we have heard for, what is it, 40 years now, that government comes in the way of stuff. Yeah. That big government is necessarily bad. Now, there are lots of countries in the world, uh, most other OECD or developed countries, in which, generally speaking, on many issues, that's not the view. Yeah. They're still market countries, but the fact is, uh, in America, when we talk about everybody having access to health care, that's considered a progressive view. When we talk about a $15 minimum wage, that's a little over $30,000 a year. That's considered a progressive yeah. view. So in other words, the, the, the view on wages by many people, many people in the mainstream, is wages are what the market should bear. So you've, you've talked about, uh, you, you've offered some prescriptives, including uh, something called a universal basic income, uh, which you've been involved in some um, experiments around. Uh, but give me some sense of what policy prescriptive, if the right people were to actually do it, meaning the people and, and, and government and maybe in partnership with, with business, what do some of the solutions to start to undo what that market's way of thinking has done to us look like? Well, I think before we even get to the solutions, we just have to turn a corner in this country, I'm entirely with Anand on this, that markets are not free. <laughs> there is no such thing as a free market. And I am a child of the 80s. I was born in 1983, and my parents both voted for Reagan. I grew up in a small town in the middle of North Carolina, surrounded by a lot of conservatives. And I grew up thinking that markets are best when they're free, that governments, it's not a force for good. The less government, the better, because the market is going to magically create abundance. That's the idea. Of course, markets are always structured. You can think about your local farmer's market, or you can think about our national economy or the global economy. There are always rules of the road. Everything from what currency can be exchanged, to the legal frameworks that hold a contract up, to who is able to, to participate, to who has the education, the, the, the skills to participate in the market in the first place. And so first off, we have to get rid of this idea that markets are ever free. Realize there's always someone writing the rules of the road, and it just so happens that the rules of the road in the economy that we live in today have been structured to help those at the very top. And listen, I think it's important to say up front that my story is um, indicative. On the outside, uh, a lot of people used to look at me and say, well, that's indicative of everything that's right about the American economy. Because I grew up in a small town in North Carolina, because my dad was a public, my mom was a public school teacher, dad was a paper salesman, got a scholarship, went to Harvard, we started Facebook there, I made a boatload of money in a few has years. Has Facebook done well? Facebook has, yeah, no. had done well. Yeah. Um, and, and that was like, the idea was, the, the idea was, man, that's the American dream, right? The whole point of my writing, the book that I have out this year, is to say it looks like that, but it's actually a myth. In reality, what happened is I worked three years, did some good work at Facebook, I'm proud of what I did, but there's no way that justifies the half a billion dollars that I made from it. And while that is a lucky break, let's call it what it is, it's been structured, our economy is structured to create these lucky breaks again and again and again and again. This is why wealth inequality in our country is the way that it is. I mean, the, statistically, most people aren't getting the lucky break. 
most people are not getting the lucky break, but that one percent is people got it, consistently. It wouldn't be a lucky break. It wouldn't be, a, it wouldn't be a lucky break. But consistently, the one the the one percent the the one percent is, and that is a purposeful structure. We could we could talk about more. So you were asking though about solutions that can. Uh, not just level the playing field, but begin to open up a new opportunity for us to talk about economic and racial justice in the United States. I think there are a lot of them. I think one of them is a guaranteed income. I am not actually in support of a UBI, a universal basic income. I am in support of the creation of an income floor in the United States. So the idea of a universal it. basic income is that everybody gets it. Everybody gets $1,000, and that's usually right. justified because the robots are rising. Uh, I think it's a pretty cynical... A guaranteed income is that... One way or the other, whether it's through your work or otherwise, there'll be a certain amount of money that comes. The idea of a guaranteed income is the automation may destroy work or it may not. So far, there's actually no evidence that it is. But there's plenty of evidence that work is coming apart because unions are less powerful, because of wealth inequality, because of, of dynamic shift scheduling. And what we need to do is uh, create some kind of stability. So $500 a month in the background for every worker making less than uh, $50,000 would be a guaranteed income. Not enough money for anybody to put up their feet and like hang out, because God forbid that's the fear that people, that people have, that people have a little bit of time for themselves and their families. Enough money that it would be a supplement. No, but really, that is a lot of the concern, right? Like, won't, will people stop working well, if just you to give make them it, a little to money? Underscore the point, uh, most Americans don't have enough money if their fridge were to break or their car were to break down or a tree were to fall. 50% of Americans don't have $500 in Correct. the case of an emergency. Right. So, so, so while $500 a month doesn't sound like anything, for a lot of Americans, they don't have anything like that. It would be huge. So I think this is a kind of big structural idea, which we've talked about in the past. Guess the last president to support this idea? Richard Nixon. This used to be the kind of thing that we could talk about in this country. It's overdue to talk about it yet again. I think there are other ideas uh, that are, are similar. We could uh, talk a lot about uh, the student debt pro uh, problem that we have in the United States. We could, there is a very large bug. Really? Oh, wow. Hold on, hold on one second. Here we are talking about student debt. Now he's gonna take a photo. Wow. I think wow. that's Zuckerberg. He's running. He's running. So just so you know, uh, talk about marketing. Uh, that's called a water bug. Uh -huh. Anybody with a landlord knows that. Anybody with a book knows it's gone. There it goes. Um, anyway, we can talk about student debt, housing, health care, a lot of different issues. We've got to think bigger if we're going to restructure the, so, the economy the way we need to. On and back to you, thinking bigger. Uh, we have a weird discussion going on in this country that I've had. Again, I'm not, that thing's coming for you. I really think this is Zuckerberg. <laughs> um, somebody keep an eye on that bug while I'm talking. Um, there is a, a weird discussion that goes on in this country in which, because of this love for markets that we've been convinced of, and by the way, against many people's better interests, we've been convinced of this. Because of that, there are legitimate seemingly legitimate conversations that go in, on in this country in which elected representatives defend the idea that everybody having access to health care would be somehow dangerous, dangerous and detrimental, somewhat socialistic in a, a UN plot. Everybody having access to a public transportation or um, uh, infrastructure being built in a way that bridges don't collapse. Uh, it, it, these are weird things. We had an entire Republican caucus support a tax bill in the last year that I don't know how many times we said this on TV was not going to benefit the average person was not going to result in factories coming back to America it was going to result in stock buybacks and guess what that's exactly what it did but someone has convinced half of America that voting for people who say things that are nonsense in their best interests on the basis of this market society that we've built is wise so when you say we need to take it back Who's we and, and what does taking it back look like? It's such a great point. You know, the way I sometimes think about this is, I think if you go back all the way through American history, there have been two kind of civil religions that have competed for our attention, that are each of which is somewhat particularly American in its flavor. And one is a religion about what we do alone, that venerates what we do alone, and another is a civil religion that venerates what we do together. And both 
are big strains. If you think about the admiration for the civil rights movement in this country, that is an, an admiration of an example of what we do together. If you think about the admiration that many of those same people who admire the civil rights movement will have for the heroic entrepreneur, um, that is an admiration for kind of what we do alone. And I think part of what has happened in the last 30 or 40 years, um, to put it in a kind of less end of the world thing, is I think we've just doubled down on this religion of what we do alone. And our culture, even our journalists, our, our entire culture has celebrated the what we do alone. Mm -hmm. And the people, on, particularly on the right, but not only on the right, who have told that story have frankly done a much better job at telling that story. I think the right is way better at politics than the left, blue waves notwithstanding, in, in, in the issues you talked about, not all issues. Um, the reality is the people on the right who've pushed for less government, less taxes, getting rid of an estate tax that touches very few people, getting rid of health care that benefits most people, etc., have done a better job of reaching under people's clothes into their hearts and convincing them of their deep kind of reptile brain fears. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's what politics is. And I think fear is actually useful if you use it for the right things. And hope is useful if you use it in the right way. And I think what we need to think about is those of us who actually believe that we need to recorrect a little bit in the direction of doing things together, of infrastructure, of healthcare, need to frankly do a better job of selling it. I hear too many Democrats talk about during the Obamacare years, we gotta do this to bend the cost curve. Bend the cost curve down. That does not get under the clothes to people's hearts. <laughs> it doesn't. And the right, when they talk about death panels and granny, you can laugh, but they're getting under the clothes into people's hearts. And so there's a lot of selling that needs to happen to make climate change not feel like homework, but an exciting enterprise to build a new kind of society that would have a racial justice component, a jobs component, and a saving the world component. But that's not how it's being sold. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to make healthcare, like, it is so dumb. You see those campaign videos where Americans sit literally at their wooden kitchen table holding bills? <laughs> like, that's, that, I assure you there's no other rich country where in political campaign ads, there's like all this footage of people holding bills. Some of those countries don't even have bills. I've gotten sick in some of those countries, like, where's the bills? Like, we don't have a printer, we, there's no bills. Um, we have to tell the story of, some of these things in a more exciting, seductive way. And I'm deeply of the view that while a turnout strategy and other things like that are great for Democrats, I think we have to win back a bunch of people who are not Ku Klux Klan members, who may have voted for Obama and then Trump and are now kind of confused, and who do feel things are rigged and sort of don't like their black boss, but like they do love their black daughter-in-law and it's complicated. There are millions of these people. It's, there, there really are. I know, I meet them all the time. And I think the Democrats need to do a much better job of, of, of reaching into their hearts and selling them a vision of an inclusive America that will still have a place for enterprise, still be dynamic, still be exciting, still have a place for men, even though men need to learn to live in an equal world, still have a place for white people, even though white people need to l l learn to live without special VIP treatment. Um, and I think there's an enormous salesmanship challenge that is, frankly, given who the president is, an existential question for this country. Speaking of questions, where's the mic? All right, Larry's got a mic. Give us your hand for your questions. Questions? Larry C., about seven rows up. <laughs> right here. Uh, when you talk about having to, um, they need to be better at storytelling, the Dems, I totally agree. But one of the things it seems is that they don't believe in their story. They keep trying to hide from it and make themselves look like Republican light. So how do you get the Dems to really believe in the story they're telling? This is a great question, and I think it involves absolutely severing the Democratic Party's relationship with big money. I, let, me, let me say the following thing, which may be controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the gonna, warning. Gonna, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, that was good, that was good, you got me. Um, when the right 
rails against government, rails against taxes, rails against regulation, and does things to help big companies. It is being authentic. That is its philosophical principle. That is where its money comes from. And that is what it sells to voters. There's no tension. You and I may not like that, or we may like it, but there's no, there's no lying there. Trump's a little different. Um, but that's an authentic, they take money from donors, and they tell, tell the people explicitly that they want the same agenda those donors have, and they sell it, and they win, and they lose. The Democrats are inauthentic, often in that score, because of the necessities, which they oppose, of having big money in politics. But when that's the reality, what the Democrats need to end up doing is be the workers' party, be the par party of people basically screwed by big money, and to raise as much big money as possible to have a chance of fighting for those values. So I understand what a tough predicament that is, but it forces Democrats to be inherently inauthentic a lot of the time. Right? It forces the Barack Obamas to raise a lot of money from people that I'm pretty sure he doesn't think deserve the amount of voice that they end up getting. And when you have the Clintons, you know, they earned, I think, $250 million after leaving office, according to the journal, after leaving office. It's not campaign money. This is totally a choice. Um, it, I'm not saying you know, you've you got to do what you've got to do with your, with your life, but if you're running in a populist age and you sense that a lot of people feel America's rigged, that's a choice that complicates leading a workers party. So I think part of this, it's not just a storytelling problem. I think Democrats need to be the party of small money. No. Period. I, I totally agree. I would also add, I think this is why someone like um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has so struck a nerve. It's not only because she is um, of the upset the nature of her victory, but the fact that when she arrived in Washington a few weeks ago, she had to worry about making rent. And what a concept. She, mm. she talked about that to the Times, and then all of a sudden, I don't know if you saw, but on Fox News, on much of, on much of the right, they, it was like, that, that was like, that, they thought that was, you know, just absurd, almost, I mean, literally, they were laughing that that, and, and fr from Can my perspective, imagine? that's the kind of leader that I think right. more, um, more and more Americans, more and more Democrats, but not just Democrats, but a lot of folks on the right, too, want to have them in Washington re representing them, and she is one of the people who's talking in a proactive, constructive way, particularly in her case, about a Green New Deal, which would include a lot of the other very specific ideas um, that, that, um, that I know the but conference today is talking about. But she's thought of as radical by a lot of mainstream Americans, which is interesting because they want a minimum wage and they want health care. Well, I think that her policies, if you look, if you take it policy by policy, as a lot of groups have done, particularly Data for Progress, you can go to their website and see, what you actually find is that a plurality, if not a significant plurality of Americans, for the most part, want a Medicare option for all, want that opportunity, believe that climate change is real. I could go through the list. And so my view is that the public opinion is actually quite clear and, and clearly aligned with someone like AOC. I mean, they they, they are very much um, in the same in the same vein. It's just a question of leadership, and having the people step forward who are like she and yep. are willing to take that risk, willing to say that they were you know small donors or, or the folks that they. One want of the last things represent. Anand said to me on TV yesterday uh, about improving uh, or the day before yesterday about improving what Congress looks like is electing a few people whose net worth is less than a million dollars. We ran out of time to have a good conversation about it, but it's an interesting point. All right, uh, lots of questions up there. One more up here. Pick. Hey guys, oh like God, your work. Reading it. Really appreciate the conversation. Uh, so, Chris, um, uh, in regards to uh, your uh, your reference to automation and how there's very little evidence of that taking over any particular well, hold your mic up future, closer to your mouth in the here. future, I was just wondering: um, Do you uh, will you disagree with Ray Dalio's uh, um, perspective and where he feels that the government should be? Uh, declaring a state of emergency in regards to the uh, prospective impact that uh, automation can make in the near future. And I think I read like 30% of jobs will be taken over by automation within 2030. Thank you. I do disagree with Ray. He's uh, made a lot of money, so that's a, a uh, very smart guy. I, I think people like you. Ray Dalio giving their thoughts is the state of emergency, but I knew you were going <laughs> to say I had a feeling you were going to say that. Uh, I, you know, Elon Musk says uh, similar things. A lot of people have talked about how the robots are are um, are rising. 
And you know, I just don't see the evidence that it's true. I'm not sitting up here saying that, that all these people are, are um, forever going to be wrong. I, I don't know, but there isn't yet any evidence in the economic data, for instance, that suggests that's true. If anything, productivity rates in the United States are going down. Now, work jobs are being destroyed by technology. Clearly, if you went to an autom automotive uh, manufacturing plant today, there'd be a lot fewer jobs than there were 40 years ago. Jobs are also being created. One of the most, uh, uh, one of the sectors where there's the most growth is in the care sector, child care, elder care, and these kinds of uh, these kinds of jobs that are critical that um, that we're going to need more of, particularly but, but as they're low boomers. wage. They they are low wage, and not only that, but a lot, so many of them are are unstable. They're part time. If you look, Alan Kruger, the the Nobel economist at uh, uh, Princeton, looked at all the jobs that we created in the ten years after the Great Recession. Nine, over 90% of them are part-time, contract, seasonal, or temp. So in other words, all of the jobs that came back after the Great Recession, the recovery, are fundamentally unstable. You might, be, ha might have 3.7% unemployment. So technology that's why is the, playing that's a role why in that. the 3.7% unemployment thing is misleading, and I always tell people, exactly. be careful about that, because it's not 3.7% like it would have been 15 years ago. Technology is playing a role in that, but it's also not true that it's sort of like the robots are rising, there's nothing we can do. We can rethink labor law, we can think, we can think about whether a Lyft driver or an Uber driver should be able to be uh, an independent contractor or an employee. I could go through a long list of things, but these are purposeful decisions that, 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 that we are making, and the idea that like we have no control, that the robots are are rising, I, I think, is is um, is is not supported by evidence yet, and also um, a little cynical, to be honest. But we have decided that we have Lyft drivers and Uber drivers who are contractors and are not employees and who do not get health care and things and like we that. Can so I, we can, all support that. Can I frame up a little M bit more? Meaning we all use it. We all use. Oh it well, by by being yes. customers of yes. the services. Yes. I want to frame up a little bit from what Chris said because I think it's so important. In your question, and Ray Dalio's thought leading <laughs> is an assumption that is actually really rife in our age and I think your very smart answer is the right poke at that but I just want to frame it up to say a lot of what wealthy interests have done in our time is try to turn social issues into issues of forces mm -hmm. rather than choices that's all said okay and one of the dominant modes of control is prediction, particularly in Silicon Valley, where you were wise enough to only spend eight months. Um, <laughs> prediction, what, what you just said is a, it's just a prediction. Just, I make, I'm just making a humble prediction. 30% of people will be on. I'm not advocating. I'm just predicting that poor people will not have jobs, and that would be so sad. Um, and prediction has become a way of advocating in disguise. If you take the idea of automation, let's say it would, in the absence of things, wipe out 80% of jobs, right? If you tax all of those companies that make a huge profit from that, substantially, and tax the wealth of people who make a bunch of money from that, and then, for example, you channeled the tax money you got from that into better public schools, and let's say, grants for people in poor communities who wanted to start businesses, that would create a bunch of jobs, right? It's not like a fixed thing. It depends what you do with it, right? If you, the care industry is growing and yet most families like, still can't afford care. If you set a higher wage, you know, you paid people in the care industry more and the government subsidized, let's say half of what a nanny or whatever makes, right? Through that money you get from taxing the robot people, you could create way more jobs. It's like, we treat these things like they're just the inept. That's the Tom Friedman business class view of the world. Yes. Right, when you're looking out from that flatbed seat and you're thinking, what is going to happen to these people? <laughs> you just think of forces. And people love these force books. But there's no forces. These are all democratic choices. choices. Yeah. I uh, had pom-poms here or something more? to uh, <laughs> I totally right, agree. I just remind you, though, that, that, we've, that there's, there, there are democratic choices that supported a decision to send the US military to the southern border for a threat that didn't exist. So. You know, I, I often have this argument with Stephanie Rule where we say, well, we could have spent that on education, and, and I said, but we didn't. And no one seems to be holding anybody account to account for not spending that money on education or on bridges or on roads or on whatever the case is. So uh, until we can get people to think about it the way you just described that, which I think is really important, I don't know how we get there. Until well, we decide that your vote is actually That not was a midterm stunt, and he lost 40 seats. So yeah. 
Yeah, well, I think people did vote on it. Maybe, maybe that's right. All right, we got one, time for one more. One more. As long as it's quick and the answer. We'll make this quick. You have said we are exiting um, the age of markets. Is there one word that encapsulates, defines the age which you feel we should call forth? Ah, yes. Great. The a age great of reform. Last question. The age of reform. Report. And there's a precedent for it. A hundred years ago, we were in the exact same situation, which should give us a little comfort. And, and again, I say this with kind of empathy for ourselves. These, if, you, if you take a historical view, there are these cycles and there are these excesses, right? A hundred years ago, there was the Gilded Age. And that was all about an age that celebrated what we do alone. It celebrated the great industrialists, the building of fortunes, and it takes crazy people to build and invent a railroad and figure that out and build telegraph. It takes crazy people working alone to, to start that stuff up, to build factories, to, and, and we shouldn't get rid of that. But there are tendencies in the age, and an age like that is a tendency of venerating individuals. And it's an age of, of markets, of business, 100 years ago. And it built great fortunes, it displaced a lot of people, it built amazing tools that have built the foundation of the modern world, but it created a lot of problems, right? You ended up with six-year-olds stitching shirts in factories, you ended up with antifreeze in medicine, because business people often end up doing that, because it saves a little money. Um, and you needed, you end up with you know, two people saying they both own the Erie Railroad, and you need to like figure it out. And we pivoted from an age of business and a gilded age to an age of reform. And we started doing more things together. Business marched on, but we electrified rural America. We got the kids out of the factories. We got the FDA and antifreeze out of medicine. We electrified rural America. We built the interstate highway system. We did civil rights. We gave women the vote. Those were all things we did together. They didn't get rid of what we did before, but they built on it and coordinated it a little bit better and allowed more people to share in it. I believe we are exactly at that moment again. And, and the one thing I will say as a total endorsement of Donald J. Trump is who better to flamboyantly discredit 40 years of believing that billionaires were gonna save us. <laughs> and I, I, I really hope that the end of the Trump presidency is not just the end of a corrupt, narcissistic um, administration, but the end of the age of markets, the end of the age of business, and the beginning of the age of reform. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you to my great guests on this. Thank you for your great questions. And we'll be signing. We'll be signing oh, we've book. got book signing outside. So. Uh, make sure you get these guys' books and you read them because you get a lot smarter for doing so. Thank you, guys.